The reason that the national labs are part of the Department of Energy, well, I guess there are many reasons, but if you go back to the Manhattan Project, you go back to the need to save the world, which is why Oak Ridge was created, and you take the science that came out of that and follow it up to the current day, the supercomputing capacity that was needed to understand the data, the understanding of physics, the understanding of biological systems, so we knew how radioactivity worked. And all that has come of that in terms of understanding the power of nuclear energy, the uh, potential of nuclear medicine, the understanding of how this affects the human body, the understanding of how to create and design new materials from the atoms up. We have to get that story out, and our nation needs our nation needs this capability because unlike the 20th century, where we in America were leading innovation and taking it to market, the rest of the world is on the case now. And will America be competitive or will America be left behind because we're not investing in science and we're not raising up the next generation of scientists and engineers? So you, I say all of that to just say I can't overstate the importance of your role in the classroom because you, more than perhaps anyone short of parents, can influence those kids to at least consider the option of careers in science and math. And you can influence those who don't go into STEM fields to respect the importance of STEM fields. And to be informed about the importance of understanding how the world works. Because the Department of Energy has the task of finding solutions to the demand for energy in a growing world, and think about this, 7 billion people in the world right now have you all seen the map of the world at night? Mm -hmm. Have you seen this? Yes? And you look at parts of continents that are dark, and you look at North Korea and it's dark, and you look at uh, the United States and there's bright light in all the urban centers. Uh, that single image conveys to me the importance of science. Because where it's dark, People are not living to the standards that we assume. You don't have a vibrant economy because there isn't reliable power. You don't have great health care because there's not reliable power. You don't have the ability to elevate people's standards of living because they don't have pan turn on the lights. We don't have enough energy to provide the world's needs or the capacity to get the energy everywhere it needs to be in the world right now to do all the things we say we want to do to raise standards of living, much less for the 10 billion people who live in the world by the time your kids are your age. So, how do we get there? Basic science. Understanding how the world works. Understanding how to make materials superconductive. Understanding how to get more energy out of the energy sources we already have. Understanding how to operate more efficiently with our building materials. The Department of Energy is the largest funder of basic science in the country because we are tackling the biggest problems like energy for a growing world. So thank you for being part of educating our next generation of scientists and entrepreneurs and disciplined thinkers Thank you for taking two weeks of your life. Thank your families for taking two weeks of your life and coming here. Um, take the word back across the country. Um, put in a good word for the national labs. I have a, an eight-year-old son and a 14-year-old daughter who, and my daughter is into science. It doesn't hurt that I work at the lab. <laughs> but uh, I'm paying particular attention right now to what you all do. <laughs>
Unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave, and I can't see all your presentations because that 14 year old daughter has a swim meet tonight. So I had a little extra helping of dinner because it's going to be a long night. I didn't know that swim meet. Um, but I look forward to what I'm able to see, and I apologize that I need to leave a little bit early. But um, thank you for uh, being here. Thanks for what you do. And uh, I hope you have a great evening tonight. Congratulations. Congratulations on what you've done in the past two weeks. Thank you. Uh, I think one thing that we, I'm not sure we mentioned, spent a whole lot of time talking about when you all were here was that you all miss Father's Day being here. So those of you who have fathers who are still living and those of you who are fathers, uh, and especially those of you who are grandfathers, I know there must be a couple of you out there, um, that was a sacrifice for you and your families, and we really do appreciate that. And we hope that you can go home with enough enthusiasm uh, and maybe some toys that we've given you or somebody else has given you to uh, make up for being away on Father's Day. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to do presentations by the different research groups. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and I'm going to let them introduce their mentors. And the first group is going to, is out of the Chemical Sciences Division and it's the Materials Chemistry Group. So if you will, will come up here and introduce yourselves and introduce uh, your mentors.
Our assignment to verify the symbol sustainable brine extracted supply of lithium carbonate is comparable to existing mine sources of lithium carbonate. Our procedure was to create this LTO through a solid state reaction and it takes two steps. Our first step is to center the mixture at a lower temperature and for a shorter time. This allows the decomposition of the lithium carbon, car, carbon and co will cause the carbon dioxide to evaporate. The second step, we had to center the remaining mixture at a higher temperature for a longer time so we could react the remaining lithium oxide and titanium dioxide to form the LTO. You're seeing some of our lab work here. In between each of our heating cycles, we had to mix the materials very thoroughly. We used a mortar and pestle to accomplish this. And our final products were labeled and analyzed for comparison. Remember, our goal is to show that the brine extracted lithium can be a suitable substitute for the commercial supply sources that are an increasing supply risk. Our first analysis was x-ray diffraction. And the first graph you see is our symbol sample. The red uh, graph shows the peaks at the blue lines, and that is the signature for LTO. There were a couple spots uh, that are marked with stars that indicate trace amounts of titanium dioxide that did not react. When we compare that to our commercial sample, you see the same signature and including the same residual peaks for the titanium dioxide. So to be certain, we overlapped our graphs and you can see that our uh, graphs show that there's no significant difference between the brine extracted lithium and the commercial sample. We were very pleased with those results. <laughs> the second form of analysis was scanning electron microscopy. Uh, the first picture you see here is our symbol sample from the geothermal brine and the second picture is the commercial source. You can see they both show similar particle size and shape. Our step was one in an ongoing project. The next step will be for an electrode slurry to be made from our two LTO samples. This slurry will be used to create the anode material for batteries, such as the ones Terry was showing. And these batteries will be tested for their performance properties. Um, I chose a collage picture to express what I'm going to be taking back home from this. Um, I've been involved in STEM professional development before and come away with some really great ideas to use in my classroom, but this far exceeded any of them. I've had the opportunity in the last two weeks to do real-world research on a real-world problem that has real-world applications. This was not an exercise of let's humor some teachers with some busy work for two weeks, and I really appreciate that. You can bet I'm going to be watching the news, uh, listening for information on new innovative batteries and clean energy sources, and know that I played a small part of that and be able to share that with my students. Now, being a biology teacher myself, I may not be able to take this exact research project back into my classroom and my content, but I have an increased confidence to implement more inquiry, research, and analysis in my curriculum. I have more experience with laboratory protocols and experimental design and process, documentation and safety. I'm more aware of how science fits into this larger picture of engineering, marketing, economics, politics, sociology, and more. I'm going to be going back and sharing all of the different jobs I encountered these past two weeks and how all of these people and jobs work together to accomplish larger goals than any one of them would be able to accomplish on their own. I have experience and resources that I've obtained through collaboration with other wonderful teachers, with researchers, and with grad students. And I'm going back with experiments using equipment, tools, and technology that normal high school classrooms do not have access to. But most of all, I'm really excited that I'm going back to a new position in curriculum and technology that will give me an opportunity to spread these experiences to many more teachers, many more classrooms, and many more students. And I believe that I can be very influential to move my district towards more STEM and STEAM-inspired directions. Thank you. What I'll take away from my STEM experience is a need to instill in my students a goal for themselves, to 
be open to opportunities that come your way. My time here at RNL has enabled me to interact with scientists and teachers at a level that I never experienced before or even dreamed of. I've been enlightened, inspired, and humbled on a regular basis during this fantastic growth period, enabling me to more closely relate to what my students go through on a daily basis. My kids are high needs individuals, 90% receiving free meals, 30% qualifying for special services, and graduation rate in the 50% range. We get great potential is still evident in many of these young people's eyes. I hope this slide helps to illustrate the variety of hands-on programs that we very recently introduced in my school. I attempt to engage young people with physical, intellectual, and socially challenging activities with the intentions of getting them hooked on learning. I think the trick to find is to find an activity or subject they're innately curious with. My next project is to acquire a quadcopter or a drone for strictly educational purposes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> After students acquire the necessary skills, we can monitor the school's new beehives, take aerial photos of school events, assist our maintenance people by inspecting our roof-mounted antennas and things along that line. After the installation of customized LED lighting, I foresee increased sightings of UFOs in northern Minnesota. <laughs> During the flight of this aerial robot, students will experience firsthand the limitations of their flights due to the batteries currently in use. This will provide me with an excellent opportunity to introduce to the students the battery science and technology that I've been privy to here at the laboratory. And somehow I'm sure there will be discussions centered around aerodynamics, electric motors, GPS technology, research and development, and certainly a little bit of drone repair. <laughs> and that is a tough act to follow. When I return to the classroom, I plan on incorporating what I learned in a variety of venues. First and foremost, I will set up a program for my 6th and 7th graders to do research in scientific discovery, technological innovations, and engineering design. Each student will receive a notebook similar to the one we have so that they can record their thoughts and data. In my classroom, there are a variety of ways in which I will incorporate sustainability, the whole issue of critical materials, electricity, and batteries. All will be focused on student self-awareness, discovery, and growth, connecting what they learn to how they live. Finally, I want to foster in my students what I felt by working with the scientists here. One of collaboration, hard work, sharing, creativity, vision, and the excitement of being on the forefront of innovation. It was a magical two weeks of aha moments, and we are very grateful for this opportunity to work with Dr. Franz. But it is only the beginning. The best is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello, uh, I'm <clears throat> pleased to be able to introduce the Biofuels uh, Group. My name is uh, Dennis Durkin from uh, Durfee High School in uh, Fall River, Massachusetts. I am Julie Bookman from Palmdale High School in California. I'm Karen Alstead from North Springs Charter High School in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm Greg Waits from Pike County High School in Zebulon, Georgia. And we'd like to uh, recognize uh, Dr. Barbara Evans, our mentor, uh, who has been absolutely wonderful the last two weeks for us, and gracious host, and amazing that she trusts us in a lab. And also, <laughs> also I'd like to introduce uh, Kelly Brady, who's been our facilitator, and our bus driver, and everything else, which has been really, really wonderful. Um, it's been um, a wonderful two weeks, and we, we were um, studying biomass and looking toward the future in biofuels. Um, when we talk about biomass, we're talking about corn, pretty much in the United States. And in our first generation, we're looking at feedstock as being a predominant um, uh, purveyor of obtaining ethanols. Um, but it has some drawbacks. It's an annual crop, uh, requires re replanting, requires large amounts of water and nitrogen fertilizer. And there's concerns about uh, sustainability. Do we produce food or do we produce fuel? And also, lastly, it's only about 30% of our biomass actually uh, it gets used in the process of the conversion. So we're looking at a second generation uh, situation here. We're looking at grasses and algae. And our goal is to use the entire lignocellulosic mass. And Barbara, I finally got it right. <laughs> it's two weeks ago, I couldn't pronounce that word. Um, so we're looking to really deconstruct the cell. We're looking to look at the cell wall and be able to take it apart to, became, to be more efficient in our production of, full, of fuel. So uh, basically we have three components to it. Cellulose, which is a, a linear polymer uh, of hexosugars in a crystalline kind of structure. We've got hemi hemicellulose, which is kind of a net that surrounds it. I kind of have an image of fish sort, sort of caught inside of the net. And then we got lignin, which is an extensive cross-linked network of polyphenol propane units. And this whole structure is recalcitrant. It does not like to be broken up. I kind of use the image of a three-year-old trying to take their toy away. They do not want to give up the glucose in there. So we're looking, as our mission, to be able to figure out a way to get rid of the lignin, to be able to get, remove the kidney cell, cellulose, and to be able to have enzymes be able to penetrate that mass in order to become efficient in producing ethanol. Um, the avenues we're using for that, we've studied switchgrass. It's a hardy and rapid growing uh, grass. It's native to America. It's grown all over the place. Um, we have, and it doesn't require much, many uh, fertilizers. Also, most importantly, it's tolerant for growth in a G2O uh, deuterium kind of environment. And I'll get back to that in a second. The second uh, group we have is winter ryegrass. It has a fast germination and it grow, grows well in the lab. And again, it has a very high tolerance for D2O. The reason for D2O is it's a growth medium, it uh, replaces water within the cell structure of the cell wall, and that allows us to be able to take a look at the micro architecture of the cell membrane. And by using equipment such as a small micro neutron scattering, we're able to take a closer look at what the micro architecture of the cell wall is. So the, uh, the task that we had was uh, in Barbara's research task one, which is preparing the sample. So we did uh, several activities uh, that were in this initial uh, task of preparing the sample. The first one is stratification. And switchgrass isn't a domesticated crop. Its uh, seeds do not germinate readily so in the lab you have to go through a process to get the seeds to germinate and uh, that stratification process is surface sterilization soaking and chill so we started out with switchgrass seeds surface sterilized them using isopropyl alcohol soaked them in a solution of schenken hildebrand basal salt mixture and uh, sealed them in a uh, culture dish and place them in a refrigerator for two weeks. Unfortunately, the two weeks are just about up and we don't get to carry that part of the <coughs> experiment any further. Uh, next, we looked at the winter grain rye seed and sterilized, surface sterilized them in a Clorox solution and then isopropyl alcohol. Uh, the seeds were placed on uh, filter paper 
in, uh, well, glass paper and one liter uh, wide mouth jars. And we moisten that with a solution of shank and hilt basal base salt mixture again and place them under grow lights at 27 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, we planted those seeds on June 13th. On June 14th, the seeds were all <coughs> um, sprouting. And on the 16th, when we came back from the weekend, uh, the shoots were approximately 13 centimeters tall. So this was the initial process of getting the seedlings ready. Uh, we don't get to do the follow through on this, but we did the follow through with some plants that uh, Barbara already had grown. Okay, another um, project that we undertook over these last two weeks uh, was the digestion of switchgrass with cellulose and cellulase enzyme. Uh, and it was a four step process. We had to start by uh, purifying uh, the cellulase enzyme. So we went and put it through a gel filtration desalting column. Uh, then we had to find out how much of the cellulase we actually had before we could um, start the deconstruction. Um, we prepared samples of switchgrass and pure cellulase. We used um, walk and filter paper number one for the pure cellulase. And we had controls with and without, or without enzyme uh, run alongside the switchgrass and cellulose with the enzyme. And within just a couple of hours, we could see the pure cellulose uh, deconstruction begin. Uh, we needed to find out how much glucose we actually could produce. And this was what illustrated uh, what the, the obstacles are here. The switchgrass samples produce less than 6% of the glucose that an equivalent amount of uh, pure cellulose produced. And the untreated, it just shows that the untreated biomass is much more resistant to deconstruction than pure cellulose, illustrating the, the problem we have with the biofuels. All right, when we talk about biofuels, the interesting thing is that we're encompassing everything. So we're talking about ethanol, we're talking about biodiesel, all those kind of different things. So one of the other things we got to look at, we're actually using algae in the production of a biofuel. Uh, and the two we looked at were the diatoms and the chlorella, which are used in the production of a biodiesel. So what they're doing is they're actually producing triglyceride, which then turns into, and as you see up here on the right-hand side, those uh, chains you see in the double O's and the R's out there, those are actually molecules of a biodiesel. So that is something we can yield out of those directly into uh, biodiesel. The diatoms right here are very interesting. They're salt water, they're like brackish water or fresh water. They're a single cell organism. They're 10 times the amount of normal silica that you would find in a lot of your other algae. Hopefully, well, most of y'all probably used either this morning or before you came over here, some of these diatoms that was actually in your toothpaste. Diatoms are actually used in toothpaste, and as you see down there towards the bottom, a mild abrasive or your um, diatomaceous earth. But also it's used in filters and insulation and other interesting areas. If you have a pool or a pond, a lot of times you'll see that yellow or mustard colored algae that looks in there. And actually what you're seeing are the diatoms. Um, the other one we looked at with the chlorella was actually a freshwater green algae. And we can actually use these in water toxicity tests to see how the uh, water is actually doing, what's happening with the water. Do you have toxins in it based on if these algae are alive or if they're thriving or if they're not doing anything. Uh, also, we had some fluorescence in there as well that we're looking at for water quality. And Dr. Evans actually has a patent on one of these uh, that's filed through the Department of Energy. Uh, big thing we were looking at with this was the algal growth rates that were in different light intensities. We set up two different ones. So we had the um, diatoms and the chlorella, and then we ran them at three different light sources as far as the lux. We had a 90.5. Uh, 122.8 and one that was 10,400. Um, if you see the chart down there at the bottom, I just kind of summarized it up here at the top real quick. The highest growth rate we had was at the 90.5 lux, followed closely by the 122.8, and then our 10,400 lux was very low, which kind of correlates with the data that you have down here below. So one of the interesting things I found was that this right here, this marine biomass turns over every two to six days. Our terrestrial turns over years to decades. So that is a huge way to look at things whenever we're looking at some of these diatoms and other uh, marine type aquatic things that we can do. 
Okay, uh, the takeaways. Um, I come from an inner city school. Uh, again, very similar to what Julian had pointed out. Our graduation rate is not the best in the state. Um, it's moving up the ladder, attempting to be able to put together more and more programs for our students. Um, I come from a kind of a unique situation. I come, I teach biology to a group of alternative high school students who are not particularly motivated. Um, they are amazed that I'm actually here. So I have to thank the Siemens people for just allowing me to be here to be a part of this. Um, the technical knowledge I've acquired, uh, bring back to the kids. Um, there are numerous programs uh, and numerous things that I've done these past few weeks that will be incredible. And the message that it sends to my particular kids is, wow, if you can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also in the fortune, um, it, it couldn't have been a better project. Come September, after much cajoling over this past year, I've acquired a horticultural program at a greenhouse for my students. And you can bet there's going to be a lot of switchgrass growing in that greenhouse. Um, also, just being able to, to, to stimulate my, my, um, my intellect, to stimulate, uh, get ideas from my colleagues here, and all of you in the audience has been just a wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, the kids at Durfee High School are going to benefit from this experience without a doubt. So again, I thank the Siemens people for doing what you're doing. Uh, keep it going because it's wonderful. Okay, I'll be going back to Palmdale High School, uh, where I am a part of the FAST Academy, which is Falcon Academy of Sustainable Technologies. And so uh, working in biofuels is right up our alley. We have a, a, an auto, automotive technology <coughs> uh, pathway in our academy, and so they'll be uh, very interested to work with me uh, in uh, anything that, that I bring back and develop. Um, some of the things that, that I'm taking back with me aren't directly the research that we did, as good as that was. Um, it's it's uh, Barbara's behavior in the lab and the things that she taught us while we were doing research. Um, she gave us a ton of background information on energy, biofuel, plant structure, and physiology. and. And that's the kind of thing that I'll be teaching in my biology classroom. So that's wonderful. Um, working with, with Common Core uh, um, standards on the review of literature, um, collecting, analyzing data, and recording that data, and uh, most importantly, sterile technique. And we're very, very careful in our lab with sterile technique. And it wasn't so much to protect us because the, the biohazard was, was very low. Um, it was to uh, keep us from contaminating uh, the uh, plants that we were uh, culturing. So that was very important and something I want to share with my kids. In terms of the research, uh, we will be growing grasses, uh, both in soil and hydroponic conditions, and monitoring the growth, light intensity, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, I'd like to try breaking down plant biomass with uh, cellulase and uh, measuring glucose from plant biomass. So um, everything we did fits right into my curriculum. It fits right into my academy. So I'm so excited to take that back. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll be returning to Four Springs um, as a chemistry teacher. I'm a chemistry teacher. So my learning curve here this week was, uh, over the last two weeks, was, was very high. The vocabulary was something that wasn't my strong suit as well. But um, one of the things that I've seen here at Oak Ridge is so much research being done on alternate energy sources. And I think um, my students will could possibly see um, this no fossil fuels uh, in their lifetime being produced. So alternate energy sources are extremely important. Uh, and I want to make that um, awareness for them through research projects, um, as well as with my biochemistry class, I can take everything that I've done this two weeks back and um, as far as the biofuels go, the obstacles and limitations are obvious, uh, but it's also an excellent unit for them to, to learn more for the biochemistry portion. Uh, as for me, we started up a new STEM Academy last year and uh, this past year, 
and it's being done via agriculture. And yes, I am an agriculture teacher. Uh, I'm on the plant end of the world, thank goodness, because I can kill enough animals to do all kind of other stuff. But <laughs> the good part is, is, is through this, you know, learning how the breakdown of the lignin and the other products that were in there and how it converts, and we take cellulose and turn that into glucose, which then, of course, starts the beginning of our normal, you know, ethanol reaction, was very, very interesting. And one of the big things that I took away was this understanding of being a student again. You know, kids walk into our class every day and they're like, what are we doing today? What are we doing today? You know, and, and you have a big picture as a teacher because you spent the time putting in all the work, putting everything together, but they're getting little bits and pieces of it as you go along. And that's what Barbara did with us. She gave us little bits and pieces as we went along, and then at the end, kind of, the best my brain can accomplish it, was be able to put it all together which is, you know, to me, the sign of a good teacher. If you can give them those bits and pieces and then they put it all together, that's wonderful. And that's what I got, you know, some of the stuff that I got this week. Um, one of the other things, we'll look at some algae and we'll look at some different ways to get some of the cellulose, to get some of the uh, ethanol out. And then the last part was just like the um, gentleman said earlier, you know, just how important research is to our lives. I mean, a lot of these kids don't really realize how important research is in their everyday life because it's not something they come in contact with every single day on a you know, touch and feel basis. It's all there, they just don't realize it. So. We want to thank the uh, overall folks as well as um, Discovery Education and um, uh, Siemens for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's irreplaceable what we've all taken away with this over the last two weeks. Thank you so much. I'm always amazed at what you all gained in two weeks and all the think, is there any way we can get our kids to do that in class? You know, have that same level of dedication and learning. Our next group comes from the Computational Sciences and Engineering Division at ORM. Good evening, uh, I'm Kevin Tambara, and I'll be doing the introductions. Uh, I, I had a chance to work with uh, amazing teachers here on an amazing project with uh, Zachary Blackwood, Stephen Lure, and Beth Pater. And our research assignment was the evolutionary computation for the solving of complex problems. I had to read that because that was complex. <laughs> and the problems that we uh, tried solving were very complex. Our group compared three different types of algorithms, deterministic, stochastic, and hybrid. Now, deterministic is something that we all know about. If you've ever punched buttons in a calculator, that's pretty much deterministic. Input in, output out. Uh, you put the same input in, you get the same output. Uh, we actually got to explore stochastic, which, are, which is more or less a controlled, random, probabilistic model. And, uh, my colleagues here, my teachers, will explain that a little, bit, a little bit more. And then what we really dived into was a hybrid model. Maybe we could combine the best of both worlds and get something even better. So one classic example is a travel sa traveling salesman problem. So imagine that you're a traveling salesman and you have to go to n amount of cities. And so let's say you have to visit 20 cities. The rules are you have to visit each city once you have to find the shortest route while returning to your original city. So, seems like a pretty easy basic problem, right? Connect the dots, count up the distance, there you have it. The problem is, um, if you try to find every possible route, that's how many it is, which is uh, in the nonillions, for those of you that are curious, uh, which would be impossible for you to calculate by hand. So if I were to try to find all those distances, look for the shortest one, it would take me about 48 octillion years to complete that problem. 
Um, so you're thinking, well, we have type, we have a supercomputer, let's just put it in there and we'll call it a day. Except the problem with that is even with Titan, it would take us 420 million years to still do the problem. Just a little information on the various of the three algorithms. Uh, the first one, deterministic, we chose the greedy approach to solving and getting an estimate for the traveling salesman problem. Uh, fairly easy, you can follow it along, just get an idea what it's traditionally done. If you look at the top left point, um, where you see the paths from that starting city, or you have a choice of 13, 11, and 21, you choose the short, so you pick the 11. Now you're at the second city, which one you pick, you have a choice of 12, 8, and 13, you pick the 8, and so forth. It doesn't always give, it will not give, necessarily give you the greatest answer because you're not able to look ahead and put the thing all together. It probably is going to take you a little bit longer to get back to where you started from. But that is just um, a kind of simple approximation of a, and it works with um, a deterministic algorithm. So uh, an alternative to the straightforward greedy algorithm is a, uh, a stochastic algorithm. Particularly, we chose a genetic algorithm. These were first uh, invented in the 70s and based on the idea of uh, evolution and natural selection. And um, the, the idea is, what if instead of simply going through the same steps every time, if you, if you use some probability uh, along the way? Um, in this particular example, what we did was we started with a population, a, a set of potential solutions. So as in our case, 100 different possible routes, just randomly generated initially. And then we took each one of those routes and ran them through a fitness function. And one of the big things you have to do is decide what makes a particular solution more or less fit. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. Just measure the total distance. The bigger the distance, the less fit it is. So you give uh, larger distances, get a lower score in the fitness function. So you take all your possible solutions, you give them all a score, and the ones that score higher are more likely to reproduce. Now in this case, what we picked uh, some of the, the higher ones, the higher scoring ones, and we mesh them together, um, similarly to how, how genes would combine uh, in reproduction. And you get a new set of possible solutions. But to keep from getting the same solutions every time, we added some mutations. And the mutations in this case just took a certain percentage of the time they would take one of the solutions and swap two of the cities. And so that would happen a certain percentage of the time just to add some more variability. And this doesn't do a whole lot after one pass, but if you repeat it over and over again, you can generate potentially the ideal solution. If you look up at that picture uh, of, the, of the lumps and bumps, that's, that's one visualization of, of a possible set of solutions. Now in this case, maybe the goal is to get to the highest peak. So the highest peak would probably be the pink one there in the foreground. And what you start with guesses all scattered across the landscape. And uh, you give them a score based on how high they are. The ones that are higher up tend to last. The ones that are farther down in the valleys, uh, you ignore them. Uh, they, they die in this case. And then you start reproducing and add some mutations so you don't get stuck. If you just said, oh, I just need to climb straight up to find the highest spot, you might well end up on this peak or this peak, but not the maximum, which is why you need the mutations to hopefully work to get the best solution. I want to show you what our actual algorithm looks like when it runs. What you're going to see is white dots representing cities and a red line representing uh, the best path that it's found so far. And you'll see it starts out very, very messy, a uh, very scattered, random path. And eventually you'll see it looks like it starts to untangle as it finds a better and better path that's shorter and shorter. So here's the actual code. And then as it starts running, you'll see that as more and more generations pass, it finds better and better solutions. That controlled randomness allows it to explore uh, the, solu the potential solution set. Not every new generation yields a better solution, but eventually, over time, you can get better and better solutions, in this case, shorter and shorter paths. And sometimes there's long gaps where nothing seems to happen, and then you'll have a breakthrough, and a new solution will be found. And there's many, many variables that you can play with to try to make it happen faster, or to get to the, uh, the best final answer.
Particularly, we looked at three different approaches. One, purely deterministic. Use the greedy algorithm, see how it works. Uh, then use the stochastic algorithm. Start with a random set of guesses and run through the genetic algorithm a certain number of times. We actually have 400 generations in our tests. So running through those steps 400 times. And then we tried a third approach, which was to start with the greedy algorithm, allow it to generate a reasonable guess, a reasonable estimate of the best path, and then use that as one of the starting populations for the genetic algorithm. So instead of starting with a purely random set of genes, a random set of cities, we started with some good, we threw in some good ones. We threw in some reasonably short paths and then worked from there to see if that improved on the greedy by itself or the, the genetic by itself. So how did it work? Um, first of all, you're seeing the uh, graph of the various solutions. Um, the higher the graph, the, the longer uh, the route. Uh, you want the shortest route. Uh, what you're seeing is the uh, mean route of the various trials. We did quite a few trials uh, to keep uh, the variables down. Um, we cut it off at a certain amount of time, kind of like saying you only have we gave them at best about a minute for them to run. Um, so kind of like if all students have an hour, um, some people turn it in early, some people turn it right at the deadline. Um, the green algorithm uh, typically got done in six thousandths of a second and it came up with a decent solution. Um, if we asked it to do it again, uh, give it back to them, it would give us the same answer. Um, the genetic algorithm um, was a slightly bit better on average, um, taking about a minute at a time. Uh, it was not statistically significantly different for this number of trials. If we'd left a run, if we gave the student more time, this program more time, it would have come up with a better answer, but we kept this to prepare the same amount of time per like selects. The hybrid was significantly better, the one that started off with um, uh, all the answers from the A students with few mistakes, um, and then worked on it. Uh, when we asked it to turn out it's one of its best answers, uh, it did come up with a statistically better solution. At a statistically significant amount. Um, so those are our results. So we can look at the, the variability, but I don't think we have time. We want to move on to other ideas. So you might think, well, this is kind of cool, but what's it got to do with me? <laughs> Just like our students say. <laughs> Hopefully, some of them will say it's cool. Uh, actually. You're probably a beneficiaries of the genetic algorithm already, you just don't know it. There's so many applications that we discovered in, in the literature, and uh, it was just mind blowing. And so uh, that's one of the things I want to take back. But uh, there's three things listed there three examples one in chemistry, designer molecules, uh, the aviation wing design, and uh, also the electroengineering uh, circuit board design. But we also found that Siemens has a patent on genetic algorithms as they relate to energy control management, which was awarded just last March, just a few months ago. So I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> <laughs> but reading the literature, reading, reading the, the, the patent, uh, this is fascinating. But anyway, uh, I want to talk about the wing shape design. This was really neat to me because I'm a former uh, electrical engineer. And so what happened was they designed uh, a wing for a supersonic transport plane in Japan. And so the genetic algorithm came up with six good solutions. And then when they compared it to the actual wing that was being used, uh, the six solutions compared very favorably, which is good. However, there was one design that the genetic al algorithm came up with that was better, that was better than what was being used and that was designed by professional engineers in Japan. Think about that. And so uh, it's just it's amazing what, what can happen when you use these genetic algorithms. I am so grateful to just have had this two weeks here. Uh, the, just the eye-opening research, uh, the, the great people here, uh, just the, the educational outreach orientation, I think, of, of all the researchers here uh, at uh, Oak Ridge has just been fabulous. Fascinating, it's just been so fantastic. I had a chance to even Skype back into my classroom <laughs> on two different days with my students. Uh, tomorrow's their last day, by the way, and I'm here. 
Um, but I Skyped back with them uh, just twice this last weekend. They are so fascinated with what Oak Ridge has been doing here. Uh, I, I had a, a blog that I, I kept up for two weeks, I posted every day, and my students just kept on inundating me with questions and comments about Oak Ridge. None of them have ever heard about Oak Ridge, but they all know about Oak Ridge now. <laughs> and uh, they know what O-R-N-L stands for. And these are 6th and 7th and 8th graders. And they're fascinated with this big, neat, fancy, shiny supercomputer. It, it just, it's just amazing. But I teach middle school life science and physical science. And so this genetic algorithm is just totally on <coughs> my line. And um, the genetic algorithm is, uh, is based on Darwin's natural selection process. So that's perfect for me. I teach life science. And so I also teach physical science. And there's so many other places I can use what I've learned here, not just with the genetic algorithm, but with the uh, other algorithms that we learn in terms of uh, uh, TFIDF, which is uh, another way that uh, we, uh, we, we can use social media to, to actually uh, uh, figure out what's going on in our world. And so there's just so many different things I can use in my classroom. Again, I'm just so <coughs> thankful for, for Siemens and uh, for ORAU and for our facilitators to give me this opportunity. Thank okay. you. As I uh, mentioned, um, our mentors before each chose this project, they introduced us to all different kinds of things that they were doing at the Supercomputer Center, uh, basically relating to us. Um, and that was quite helpful. We are not going have time to mention everything. Uh, so I'd like to thank Dr. Patton and then Brad, uh, one of his um, mentors, who he mentors, has also helped us out and showed us quite a few things um, to open our eyes to all the world that's out there. Um, as far as taking me back to the classroom directly from this, um, one of the big things I mentioned is how do you determine the fitness function. Um, and so um, very often I can jump to the classroom where I am right now, the uh, finding the distance, that is the fitness function. And so they found the distance, and so what? And this thing you can say, okay, now this is what you can do with it. Uh, the other one is more of an inquiry-based education. How do you know what's more fit? And what kind of function will best fit and best work to get a solution you're looking for in this particular area? So it opens up and gets them to think a little more critically and actually apply um, the formulas they use, which is what you're always looking for. Um, other things I have opportunity is just talking with uh, the 19 of you all. Uh, the colleagues here just opening eyes to other areas, uh, inspiring me, so I thank you. Um, and I'll be taking this back um, as department chair. I'll be working with the other math teachers. There's several other things that we put in place there uh, that we've been talking about. And I'll also be able to work with the elementary math teachers in the district. Um, we, we are meeting kind of on a regular basis and we'll talk about, did you hear about? And so that'll be a great kind of inspiring me. You really ought to listen to me. I've been at Oak Ridge. I've brought that quite a few times. Um, <laughs> that'll be great. And uh, the other one is, is that as part of this package that we're getting the ability to purchase something for our classroom, that is wonderful because I'll be purchasing um, from National Instruments um, a data acquisition package so the students have real data to work with. And then they'll put it together and um, do the math with that. So that was, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm sure we all could all go on and on about all the things that we've learned. And I would say back, I'll try to keep it fairly brief. Uh, I teach uh, physics and, and computer science and engineering, um, and I'm very excited. Um, in terms of computer science, I've studied a fair bit of computer science. I thought I did a minor in it in college and <laughs> have done a lot of it for fun, but never worked with genetic algorithms. And so this is this is something I'm very excited about taking back to my students next year when, when we have computer science at our school for the first time. Um, uh, the, the whole idea of parallelization is something I hadn't worked with before, and I'm excited about that. Uh, maybe we'll try to get our hands on some Raspberry Pis and set up our own tiny Titan like they showed us. Um, and physics, we uh, I've got a lot of new ideas for, particularly for simulations that are out there, and we've been shown a lot a lot of neat ways to, to make simulations and um, and even have students create their own and with a little bit of basic programming to be able to manipulate variables and see what happens if they change this and that. Things that they couldn't change uh, in the real world, things that they can change in a, in a physics simulation. So I'm excited about uh, bringing that back as well. As, as well as research, I'm really uh, encouraged to have my students do research from, from meeting with the researchers here and talking with other teachers that have done it in high school and middle school. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, having my students do research projects next year. 
Uh, as a high school math teacher, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to get um, coming in here, what program they're going to I'm like, that's okay, I'm a quick learner, I'll figure it out, I'll find a way to fit it in, but uh, I couldn't have gotten a better selection by putting uh, with a computing group. And one of the things I was, I was thinking all the time about how am I going to say what I'm going to take away, and not because I can't come up with something, but I can't narrow down the things that I'm coming away with. And for me, with a love of curriculum writing, which I know isn't very common, but I do, I love writing lessons because I love writing the curriculum. And one of the things um, that we can come away with from this is just all of the critical thinking skills we've learned and all of the different pieces. But there's a phrase that we say around my building, and it's we need to teach kids for their future and not for our past. And I can't think of a better two-week program that has, has done that for us. Everything we've done has been in life uh, or in the moment research with scientists who are planning for the future, and I just can't think of a better way for us to accomplish that. So in closing, we'd like to say a special thanks to Dr. Robert Patton, who couldn't be here with us today, um, for taking time out of his schedule to answer our million questions. Um, he's introduced us to new ways of thinking, and every time we come up with something, he would challenge us to push it even farther, and he has been instrumental in us growing over the last two weeks, and he has provided us with so many future contacts. Uh, Brad, for taking time out of his day to find us so many resources and great ideas for teaching. ORAU for coordinating just such a comprehensive schedule of events for us. Siemens Foundation and Discovery Education for making something like this amazing this possible. Thank you. As a former math teacher, I would have really had fun with you guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and I'm delighted to know that a lot of the computation skills and knowledge and um, excitement can go back into the classroom from, with you all. We're, I want you all to five years that we have been doing the Stars Department. This is the fifth year. This is the first time we have ever hit the break ahead of time. Yes. <laughs> And I don't know if any of you mentors need to leave. So before we break, the one thing I do want to do, and I do hope you're able to stay here all of it, but I would like for the mentors to stand up, please, and be recognized. Okay, I think we're ready to get started again. About sixty percent of you who are going, ah. Huh. Forty percent of you who are going, okay, okay. <laughs> Our next group is from the Material Science and Technology Division. Okay. Uh, my name is Jessica Fogel. I come from Forsyth Central High School in Cumming, Georgia. I'm Rebecca Kinneberger, and I'm at Mesa Preparatory Academy, which is in the Phoenix area. And I'm Daniel Neumeyer from Center, Colorado. Uh, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> working in the tensile lab with Chris Stevens and the magnetics lab with Bart Murphy, who's not here. And we'd like to thank our um, mentor, Dr. Edgar Rivara-Cruzio. Uh, and we'll be discussing the effect of magnetic fields on the plasticity of metals. So first off, what tensile strength is, is it's a measure of how much stress a specimen can take before it breaks. And here's a demonstration. Um, a graphic that shows the different types of stress. You've got tension, which when you pull on an object will lengthen an object and, sh and make the width skinnier. You've got compression, which when you push on both ends of the object will make it shorter and the width wider. And then shear stresses will shift atoms along their atomic planes from side to side while, without changing the volume while the other two change the volume. And we're interested in exerting tension on an object, but then we'll also be interested in local shear stresses, which we'll come back to. So when you exert a, for, or a tension on an object, you will elastically deform it, which means that up to a certain point, if you release the tension, the object will return back to its original length. But after a certain point, you start to plastically deform the object, which means that when you release the tension, it will not go back to its original length that it will be permanently lengthened or plastically deformed. So we were working with metals which are very ductile due to their uniform distribution of electrons. 
Um, this represents a perfect crystalline or lattice structure of metal atoms, and it shows what happens when you exert a shear stress on the lattice. The atoms will eventually shift over one, which we call one dislocation. Now, the true nature of, a met of metallic structures is that there is no perfect crystalline structure. There will be, there could be voids, which are atoms that are missing in the structure. There's line defects, which is evidenced here in uh, the diagram. You've got interstitials, which are atoms where they're not supposed to be in the lattice, and grain boundaries, which we'll come back to in a moment. So this is a demonstration of what happens when you exert shear stresses on a true metallic structure, and you can see the dislocation move in the direction that the force is applied. So if you were to take a close-up look at a metal, you would see what's in the upper left-hand corner, where the atoms are not perfectly lined up horizontal and vertically. Um, and you'll see that there are groups of atoms that are in the same orientation. And so I've outlined those for you in the bottom right, and those represent the grains in metals. And why the grains are important is what we were doing is we were exerting tension stresses on a specimen. So we we're pulling on the top and bottom. And that's overall tension, but if you look at the way the atoms are oriented, they're going to be experiencing local shear stresses. So if you think back to the dislocations that we were talking about, if you inserted a grain boundary, then the dislocation might stop moving at D instead of moving all the way to H, because it acts as a wall. And so as dislocations move, they might back up on grain boundaries. That's a problem when you're trying to make wires because the larger the grain, the more dislocation can move, and the more dislocation can move, the more plastic deformation you have. So if you have very large grains, you can have large plastic deformation and you can make wires. The smaller the grains, the harder that is because if you have a small grain and you try to make a wire, it's gonna end up cracking because the dislocations stop moving after a short period, build up and then crack your material. So why are we in, interested in magnetic fields? Well, first of all, annealing <coughs> is a process that will let atoms move and shift into their lowest energy configuration, where they're most happy in their lattice structure. And magnetic fields potentially have the ability to enhance the movement of atoms into their lowest energy configuration by playing on their, the magnetic, magnetic moments due to the spin of the electrons. And so what we have the potential to do is move around grain boundaries to allow for more or less plastic deformation. So the questions that we were investigating were, what's the effect of magnetic fields on dislocations, as well as how much ma of a magnetic field would be required to accomplish this goal? And I've already discussed a couple of those uh, implications for, for like the production of wires, the prevention of cracks, forming in structures that you've already created, like car parts um, or wind turbines, that you would like to heal instead of having to take out and replace if you could keep the dislocations from moving and causing cracks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to be running you through the procedure that we have in the lab. So I'm going to start with our lab safety. <laughs> number one, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> number two, don't hurt anyone else. And number three, and most importantly, don't burn down a lab. <laughs> um, but we did have some major safety concerns that we wanted to address. The first was eyewear. We were uh, cutting some rubber bands and they would fly all over the place, they would hit you in the face. So if we didn't have proper eyewear, that would have been an issue for us. And then we also have to keep in mind that there are moving parts and so we need to wash fingers and things like that. This is our test rubric and so what we wanted to look at were different amounts of magnetic fields. So we looked at 1, 5, and 9 Tesla. We also looked at different strain amounts. So we were taking the samples to 0.1, 0.3, and 0.5% strain. And then the amount of time they were exposed to the magnetic field. So we did 10 seconds, 100 seconds, and 1,000 seconds. So this test rubric helped us keep the samples in place and know where we were going to have them and how long they were in the magnetic field. This is the machine that we were mostly working with. So on the left, we have the load, uh, which is above the test sample region. The test sample is over here on the right. Um, so the tiny little strip that you have in the center, that's our nickel. And so we have grips at the top and the bottom, which we are using to hold it in place and then to stretch it. 
This is a picture of the Epson sonometer. This is attached to the nickel sample, so that strip in the center of the nickel. And so it's attached by those rubber bands that we were breaking often. And it's measuring very specifically how much that sample is being stretched. So it's connected to our computer, and we can look at any uh, time, see what the strain is, see what the load is, and how much it's been stretched. And this is what we were looking at on the computer real time. So these are our plots. She was telling you about the elastic and the plastic deformation. So as the curve starts to increase, that's your elastic deformation. And then once it bends and you start to see that straight line, that's when you've moved over into the plastic region. And as we were testing, we were documenting, documenting, documenting. So we were keeping track of everything, the strain, the load, uh, before and after time. And some of the things that you may not think to keep track of, temperature and humidity, those are things that can affect your sample. So whether it's cold or hot in the room, your samples can be responding to that by expanding or contracting. So we want to make sure to keep track of that. As well as the scientist that was running the experiment because Chris is telling us that sometimes they'll get a call 10 years down the road and they need to go back and see what was done in the lab. So you want to keep track of the person who was running that. This is the magnet that we used. And so the setup that we had for this was a PVC pipe. We would put the nickel samples down at the end of the pipe, which had a cap on it, lower it down into the magnetic field, and then we would start the time once it got into the uniform magnetic field. And these are some of our initial results. So what we were looking for was whether or not the magnetism would have an effect on removing that plastic deformation. And so what we would expect, if that were true, if the magnetic field was healing the nickel, is for these graphs to line up perfectly. Uh, if, if they don't line up perfectly, uh, then that's telling us that it, this isn't working, that the magnetic field isn't working. And so what we're seeing is the aftergrafts, which are in red, you're having a higher yield. And so at this temperature, at room temperature, we're not seeing that the magnetic field has an effect. And so what we'd like to look at in the future, and hopefully we convinced Edgar to have another STARS team later in the summer, is looking at different metals, so aluminum, stainless steel, uh, and also adding a little bit of temperature because, as Jessica said, they use temperature now to anneal copper wires, things like that. But if you can have a little bit of temperature and a magnetic field, you can decrease the energy that you're using. Okay, so now how does this apply in the classroom? So we got together, this has been a fantastic team to work with. Um, and we, we started talking about what are the main takeaways for, for our classroom that we're going to put to work right away. Well, the first thing is the lab notebook. We now have copies of each other's lab notebooks, so we have these fantastic examples to take home and show our students. We also learned how important this is and how critical it is in documenting the work you do. If you look here, this is a pretty important piece of documentation right in front of you. This is the, you look right here, down right under where it says five it says critical reach this is the actual lab notebook from the graphite reactor when it went critical and you can see all the little notes and even the mistake that's scratched out and changed um, it's pretty important to document your work and i think this shows that another classroom application we looked at was a lesson format because it's been a long time since we've all been students in the classroom and we spent our first time with Edgar in, in a classroom, and he gave us information like crazy. And it was pretty awesome, because there was no messing around. We were, we, were, we were learning. And so we thought, how could we put this into the real world classroom? And because we loved it, so I've, I've learned that as I teach. If, if, if I'm having a good time and enjoying class, usually my students are. So we started thinking about we could do like a super intense lesson at the start of a class period, cover that, those things we need to cover that are tied to the standards, and then give students real world work to do, where they could work on an independent research project applying those skills that they learned. Um, we want to let the students do it, just put it in their hands. Chris let us run all the machines and do what we needed to do with it, and then start again the next day. You know, and then you have the quality reflection in your lab notebook. We also had a whole group of things that we decided to just kind of throw in a group all together. 
we had the idea of having student lab techs for your classroom. Why don't we do this? We don't need to do all the work. We can have someone who's perfectly talented, a student, come in, do an application pro process, and they can do this work. Uh, we also came up with some amazing uh, materials labs that we can do now with, with uh, working with the high precision instrumentation we use. We think we can build our own. You know, They won't be as precise, but they'll be as effective in teaching the lessons. And we took some content knowledge away. I think the strongest we all looked at was systems in nature find the lowest energy configuration. So we think that's an important takeaway from it. And then results can be messy. So we can show our students that you don't always get the perfect answer that you're expecting, and that's just as important. Well, we'd like to thank everyone who contributed to our, to our work here. Um, we, we all feel it's very important, and we thank you so much for investing in teachers. Uh, a lot of people don't invest in teachers. They tell teachers what to do and how to do it and blame them, but you guys invested in it. And when you invest in a teacher, you give us the opportunity to empower a group of students to go out there and change the world and make a difference and do these amazing things. So we want to thank all those people for doing that for us, giving us those opportunities and chances. And we want to close with telling you that it's, it's definitely it's all about the electronics. <laughs> thank you. I wish there were more administrators who understood that good classrooms were always messy. Yes. Of course, our mothers would never agree with us, but as teachers, we all know good classrooms are messy. Uh, our last group is the Biosciences Division. Doctage. And uh, of course, we've got our other ones uh, like Colin and Amber and Karuna and Jesse. We're just so so excited. Ryan uh, and Dave. So excited that all of you guys can be here. That's, that's amazing. That just shows you how much support that we received due to have them here, too. So it was great. Um, by the way, PMI, if you're interested, stands for Plant Microbial Interfaces. The ORNL PMI webpage does a great job of describing the project. They say the Plant Microbe Interface Project's goal is to understand the dynamic interface that exists between plants, microbes, and their environment. A specific focus is on defining the genetics based on molecular communication between Poplis and its microbial communities. There are several reasons why scientists would study these communities. The focus at ORNL is to understand the chemical and physical processes of microbes in their natural environment, which will help scientists understand and identify an ecosystem's response to things like climate change and other ways we impact ecosystems. Additionally, their research will assist in the development and management of renewable energy sources. Our mentor's uh, goal since last Monday was to give us a sample of the work that is done um, in their project. However, they gave us much more than that. Uh, they gave us uh, the opportunity to work with cutting edge technology. We met some amazing people, and we even fell in love. <laughs> oh. Well, 
you see we were each assigned a specific bacteria and we grew pretty fond of those bacteria during, <laughs> during our time. So mine, by the way, was GM30, so you know, back off people if you want to you have to get in line, so. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we received an incredible overview with nine unique processes. Each of the modules that we, that we took part in showed us how they characterized the microbiome of the plants uh, we worked with, and we were each given a, a packet which provided the steps to each of the processes that were introduced to us. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Judy to uh, give you more details. Okay. All right. There we go. Um, okay. Clicker. Hold with left. Clicker front. Um, so picture there. Um, shows Dale. Dale is out on vacation. He couldn't be here. Harvesting a sample. He's pulling out a populus. Uh, we then cultured the, cultured the microorganisms and isolated. We really worked with the root, uh, with the root biome. That's also what, that's what was used in our extensive study. Um, the bacteria, the bacterial samples where the populus trees came from, um, were from plants, populus plants by the Yadkin River area and the Kinney Fork River area, which are both. Really, I have one's in Tennessee and one's in South Carolina. Um, what? Why populous? Um, it grows widely across the U.S. and even under poor conditions, so it probably would even grow in Chicago. Uh, it's <laughs> growing, and the genome has been sequenced. Uh, we begin. We began by using Orton Pestle to grind samples of root section, then. Um, we made plates, which are in the picture there, and uh, grew them overnight. Each plate is of a different um, dilution, and the reason why we did the six there was so we didn't know just how much bacteria was contained there, so we were able to pick uh, the best fit for, our, uh, for obtaining our samples. Um, from the culture, individual bacteria types you were used to make isolated cultures. This is where we, um, as Steve said, we, we got ownership. Each group received um, a different type. Mine was CF313, which was better, I think, than the GM. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> although, Brandon's uh, GM41 was a strain that we used to pursue a more in-depth study. Oh, I'm still at um, this was This was a great beginning for us. We tested individual, we took a Arabidopsis seedlings, um, grew them, they, well, we had, we had to pick these little tiny little plantlings, um, and we put them on uh, nutrient agar, and um, then we swabbed, we each, we swabbed our bacterial samples below the roots, and then they were um, put aside for, we kept checking on them, and um, it was really fascinating that some of the bacteria really, really uh, improved root growth, uh, branching, and it was really obvious. And then some bacteria, especially one, really did not like, um, uh, the roots did not like them. In fact, the plants didn't really well them. Okay, now I can get it Okay, then we took our isolated <coughs> cultured bacteria and we scraped off a little part of it and put it in a carbon-free liquid media. We allowed it some privacy and some time so that it could multiply. <laughs> then we took those biolog uh, plates, which have 96 wells. In these, each of these 96 wells, there was a different carbon substance. And so what we did is we had these cool instruments that was a micro channel pipette and we got to use them to inoculate the entire plate and then we had to leave them so they could be cultivated and then the data was taken and when we looked at this data we found out that gm41 and yr343 really loved the myoanesthetol all right, as you guys can tell, our group loves bacteria, so <laughs> we love microbes. All right, um, so as she said, we observed bacterium GM41 and YR343 
thrive in myo-inositol. And what myo-inositol is for bacteria is just like the chicken and the um, rolls that you guys ate out there to give you energy for your body. Um, myo-inositol gives bacteria energy. It makes, creates energy. Um, to understand which proteins help these microbes utilize myo-inositol, we subjected them to bottom-up proteomics, where we observed observe which proteins actually worked inside that bacteria to break down the food or break down the myo-inositol. So first we grew GM41 on the auger plates with myo-inositol. We collected and lysed the GM41 bacterial cells and extracted all proteins. After that, we had to break down the proteins because they were all balled up. We broke them down into small segments called polypeptides. And um, then we put the peptides into a mass spectrometer for 24 hours. Our results showed that a total of 500 proteins were identified in the sample. Amongst which of the proteins unique to myonositol's degradation pathway. All right, so the chart up there shows you guys the degradation pathway for proteins. And these proteins help break down myonositol to create energy for bacteria GM41. So throughout this, pro throughout this process, um, the genotyping was extremely interesting and very complicated for me, but the phenotyping is where I really, um, was my comfort zone. Um, so we were able to make many physical observations with our eyes, with um, the very high-end instruments and of the Ar Arabidopsis plants. We looked at the roots, we looked at isolated bacteria, we looked at fungus, we looked at interactions with the bacteria and the plants and with the fungus and the plants. and. Um, we were able to see interactions, but we needed, um, you can see the physical plates here. You can see Shonda's in the middle, on top middle. Uh, doesn't look so good, but all the others are looking really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from these, we were able to make qualitative observations uh, to help us understand the microbe-plant interaction. So this is an image of GM41. This is Brandon's bacteria um, using the atomic force microscope. This was in uh, Dave's lab. Uh, this is a scanning probe instrument that can give 3D surface profiles of the microns at, at the micron scale. So we all got to uh, mount our bacteria and take a look at these. Um, and this was amazing to look at both the topographic and the deflection images. And while we were waiting for each other to, to look at each other's um, Microbes. We got to play a little bit. Um, we got to look at the desktop electron microscope. Uh, we looked at some pretty creepy images of uh, ticks and um, spiders that we'll bring back to all our students. Um, <laughs> um, and Dave so graciously <laughs> gave us a file of these awesome pictures. That was just an aside. Okay. Um, the next, the next images were. Um, this is using a confocal laser microscope. Uh, uh, so we took our bacteria and we uh, used a fluorescent stain. You can see first on the left it's a live stain of just the isolated bacterium. And on the right is actually a piece, a slice of the roots that uh, were growing with the bacterium. And you saw the, the images on, with the slides. And we took a piece of the roots, we put those in stain, and we were able to look at those through the through the, micro, the same microscope. So they're both live cultures, one's with the root, one's isolated. And this is Brandon's again. And it's beautiful. <laughs> so we had lots of fun with this and with Amber. And um, <laughs> um, we just enjoyed the, the view and took lots and lots of pictures. But uh, it wasn't until the end when we talk, took a look, Shonda was the last one for us to look at. And we were just awed by these pictures and we we're like, something's wrong here. So on the left, you see Shonda's roots and the microbes, which are just prolific, and the roots look mangled. And on the right, you see Brandon's healthy uh, roots with his bacteria, GM41. So the left 343, wire 343, um, we're thinking that something's going on. We can clearly see that there is a reaction here. Um, uh, so uh, there's an obvious root response on the plate. Okay. Um, we continued um, 
Well, those are some things that they're noticing. That's the whole point of the EMI project, to take a look at the interactions and see um, how they interact. Um, we got to go further, though. Finally, we got to play with uh, or see what they're playing with. Um, cutting edge, we got to see the cutting edge research um, that Ryan is doing um, in his, with his uh, um, fabricated chips here. So this is, um, they're studying microfluidics and they're using this um, technology to really be able to further isolate the bacteria. Um, uh, they are chemical engineers, both Brian and Colin. Uh, we also noticed that so many of the scientists there are engineers as well as um, studying science in all other disciplines. Um, so these scientists went into great detail. They really explained um, how they made the devices, how they are making the prototypes, not failures, prototypes, that they're learning from getting better and better. And um, they showed us the procedural protocols that they're developing. Um, we got to image the fluorescent E. coli and the microtubes, and that's what you're looking at um, um, in those tubes. And they're sending with E. coli because they're still in procedural steps. Um, so those are micro channels, also known as buckets and tubes. Um, so anyway, we got to see how they're revolutionizing medicine. And we were, we felt like we're on the cutting edge, and we appreciate them showing us through that lab and all those processes. And we got to take home some of the microchips here, the, the, the micro tubes and buckets. Okay, so the final way that we looked at our awesome GM41, because obviously it was the coolest bacteria of the six. Uh, so we really did a lot of in-depth studies with GM41, and uh, what we did uh, as one of our last processes was something called uh, quantitative polymerase chain reactions, or as the cool kids in the lab call it, qPCR. So we are looking at uh, ampli amplifying some DNA and mRNA to kind of quantify the, uh, the, a sample against the known sample. Um, it's a, a really cool process, required us to uh, get into some micro pipetting with like tiny, tiny little bits. So thankfully we have a fantastic mentor um, to uh, assist us with that and identify and kind of give some tips on that. Uh, but uh, the idea was that we were trying to find some genes that were being expressed in that whole uh, pathway of digesting the myonositol um, through all of that. Um, QPCR is this really cool process, I'm not going to go into all the details, uh, because as Marie said earlier, the, the most important thing about this whole program, uh, obviously we've learned so much and we've gotten so much out of this, but the important thing is what we're going to take back to our students. So we're really excited about that. Uh, all of us can go on and on and on, uh, but we won't, about uh, the exciting things that we want to do, but uh, we do want to take a minute and kind of share a little bit of how we're going to apply this into our, our classes. So uh, I'd like to turn it back over to my favorite Texan, uh, Steve. Well, thank you. I, you know, there are so many takeaways that you can that you can get from uh, a program like this. Um, but working with with these guys with these guys with these guys, um, you really get um, the idea that they love well microbes. But um, the that there is all kinds of different processes that go into the research that they do. And um, in sixth grade science in Texas there are two very applicable units that, that I'm going to apply this to. Um, one is, is going to be ecosystems, and the other one is our unit on organisms. And uh, being able to uh, see how they take samples from just outside, basically, and bring them inside, and uh, that, that's going to be something that the kids are going to love to do, is to go out and collect the samples, bring them in, and then we're going to be able to culture bacteria um, and, and, and really give the students um, a hands-on experience to show them how bacteria, um, how, how there's so much bacteria um, that are living within the soil that I can bring it back to the importance of that bacteria and how that bacteria plays a role in the entire ecosystem and the health of the plants too. So that's just one way that I'm gonna apply it. Uh, there's so many other ways, uh, but after all, we only have 20 minutes, so I'm gonna go Okay, um, I promised my group I'd keep it short. I did whittle it down from about six pages. To, so, um, I, I, as you've heard before, just so many applications into the classroom. Um, with me getting placed into a biology group, which that was just a lifesaver for me. 
and probably for my future students. I've been teaching physical science for the last 23 years to eighth graders. I found out at the end of the year that, oh, you gotta pick up sixth and seventh grade, a couple of those, and it's life science. So um, again, um, it, it, what I've learned is just phenomenal. Um, and I, I'm, I have the confidence now to think that I can provide some really, really cool things for my kids to do. Um, one of the things I, again, the first day we walked in, we got a tour of the labs, I'm looking at the microscopes. My gosh, my kids probably have no idea the different types of microscopes. You know, a microscope looks like this, and you look at little crawling things, and that's it. So I can share that, go into the history of the, um, the, the history of the microscope and how technology and science are so related with the equipment um, and vice versa and how all the different um, strands of science are related. I do want to talk about one thing though. This is kind of like a special one that I really got into the thing where you saw the, the dishes with the, with the bacteria swabs and the little Arabidopsis. I just thought that was so cool. What a way to talk to my, to present to my sixth graders, you know, because they're coming in bacteria, bacteria are bad, we want antibacterial soap, you know, we want, you know, and just to introduce to them that bacteria, yeah, it's, it, it's necessary. Um, so I thought if I could get those little plant seedlings and if I could take a bacteria swatch, but then that probably wouldn't work out. So Colin, thank you so much. He came up with the idea that, well, what if I took fertilizer that has bacteria in it? I didn't know that that has it in it. Maybe that's why manure works well. I don't um, But, and then take a fertilizer and do something to it, heat treat it, boil it, to remove the bacteria and have my students um, take it from there. That's gonna be a work in progress. And really, I'm thinking, again, I'm trying to keep it short. I was going on and on and on. January, I'm sure I'm going to be coming up with more ideas of how I'm gonna apply this. One last thing is I do run a network of science teachers in the Chicago area. Um, we meet regularly to share ideas and you know just kind of pass on information. So everything I learned today and um, from my mentors, you were wonderful from the speakers we had, and really from my colleagues. I have to tell you, this is a great group to work with. They were so helpful for me, you know, with my lack of biology background. Um, but if you want to know some physics, I can help you. Um, and, and just everybody, it's been a great, um, great experience, and I am going to pass all of that on. And I'm going to go back to Argonne National Lab, which I am a part of. I help them out a little bit and tell them how to really run a fantastic program for teachers. So they <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I teach physical science as well, and I don't teach biology. I don't perceive teaching it in the near future, but I actually will be teaching it in my physical science class because I learned that, that science doesn't happen in isolation. So we're going to grow plants and um, doing exactly what Judy's doing, using the, the elements. And what a great avenue for the kids because they love biology, they love growing plants, and so I can sneak in the chemistry to the plants. Um, so throughout the night days, I saw scientists working collaboratively, and that was just so amazing to truly know that science doesn't happen in isolation. I saw scientists loving their job, but well, we love our job, and you love your job, and we got along so well, and you taught us so well because you love your job, and I think that's what, what we do for our students. Um, we saw you designing your own experiments. We saw you fabricating materials so that you could help the scientists design or follow through with their experiments. Um, so we saw science that complex social behavior, and that was really cool to bring back. Um, creativity, ingenuity, logic, um, all those things that we try to instill um, in our kids. Um, so I'll be doing exactly what, what Judy's doing and probably a little bit of some of the other, we'll continue to communicate. Um, <laughs> we have a nice network that we've developed here. Um, and working individually with students in research projects um, in all aspects and all disciplines. Um, focus, the focus on nanoscale technology, um, size and scale, that's huge. And it's, it's in our standards. And um, never really had a, a real grasp on other than just, you know, there's a, a cell versus um, an atom. But now I just can bring so much more back, especially using our, our new tools. Thank you.
So I, uh, I think the, the coolest part about the project, and really what I'm going to take back to my students, it really stems from the, uh, the super group that we were a part of. Six of us teachers, we had 14 mentors, uh, that it was a fantastic group to work with. And the exciting thing was that each one of them brought something unique to the table. Where we were in a lab with Colin and Nathan to start, and they were teaching us one thing, and then they sent us off to someone else who had an expertise in something else, but really all of them came together to not only help us, but to be working on the PMI project. Uh, it, it's been a great experience because we've gotten to learn a little bit from each of them. And the way I'm gonna take that back to my kids is really to help them understand that each one of them in their own unique set of skills and personalities and gifts and talents, that they have a, a, a unique set of skills that when brought together can really equal something that would be greater than they could achieve by themselves. Uh, again, as Terry said, the, the idea that science isn't done in isolation and that they're working together. They have a great respect for each other and I, I really admire everything that our mentors have taught us, but also how well you work together just so fluidly. It was fantastic. So I really want to take that back to my kids and, and show them, you know what, you need to recognize the gifts <coughs> that each of you have and that the gifts that you recognize in others and uh, learn how to use those and work together for the, uh, the greater good. Okay, I'm going to take mine back to aquatic science mainly, but the coolest thing we found here is that I found people that had enthusiasm and passion for what they like, and that was really cool because we usually think we're just the crazy ones in the bunch, but they also are the crazy ones, and they really wipe out that stereotype of the old white bald headed guy in the lab that doesn't have any better life, you know, like the kids will say, don't you have a life? This is stupid. You know, but it's not. They have the same passion we do, just in a different way. And in an aquatic science classroom, I'm sure you're all familiar with the chemical cycle that takes place in salt water. <laughs> it's a nitrogen cycle in which nitrosomes and nitrobacters are very, very important bacteria. And now I would love to actually culture nitrosomes and nitrobacters and in conjunction with Texas A&M University, allow them to allow my students to actually see them and separate them out and maybe feed them different nutrients to see if really this one loves to eat ammonia and this one loves to eat nitrite like I've been telling them forever and ever. Okay, so that's basically, but really it's just the renewing and rekindling of that spirit and that excitement and that somebody else really likes this stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I teach in an inner city school in Columbia, South Carolina, and I'm always seeking new, invigorating ways to keep my kids engaged in my classroom. If I go inside my classroom just passing out worksheets, my kids are falling asleep, bored and everything like that. But coming here to the Siemens program and work with PMI and work with bacteria, if I pull out the microscopes and have my kids looking at microbes under the microscope and um, creating authentic activities, um, to focus on the classroom environment, um, it makes it more exciting for my kids. In my class, I teach ecology, and ecology talks about the interconnections amongst ecosystems. And I usually focus on everything that goes on above ground, so I want to focus more on bacteria and teaching my, teaching my students <coughs> how bacteria is important to create a stable ecosystem. And as well, um, last year, I started a bio biology bonanza tutorial. And what that is, students come after school and they work with me, it's a tutorial, they work with me to get extra skills, hands-on opportunities to reinforce what I'm teaching in the classroom. But this year, since I came here and I learned all these research techniques and I got in contact with all these um, doctors and everything like that and these major researchers in o at ORNL, um, I plan to make some authentic lessons just for this after school program um, so that my kids can actually do research in the program after school. Uh, we would like to thank Siemens, ORNL, Discovery Education, and everybody that made this um, opportunity for all of us teachers. Like, we're going back to our classroom to inspire our kids to be future scientists, future molecular biologists, future chemists, future chemical engineers, and that it's okay to think, think outside the box. It's okay to get your hands dirty. It's okay to be creative. So we just thank you guys for giving us that opportunity, everybody that played a role in getting us here. Thank you. Um,
say I've had much more fun during parts of this week with you all than I've had in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to envy some of that time that you all have had. Um, it's going to be my great pleasure to introduce you, and, and so, I think you've all met Jennifer. But Jennifer Harper Taylor is the president of Siemens Foundation, and she came to us with a desire five years ago to do something special for teachers, to do something within the national laboratories. And she has kept this vision alive, and she's a tremendous supporter. And she believes in what you do, and she believes in you, and she believes in your kids. And so I'd like to introduce Jennifer Harper Taylor. expertise to do the walking and the talking and the animation. <laughs> but again, um, it's been a pleasure to be here tonight, first and foremost, to see so many old friends. Um, being here at Oak Ridge is always like being at home. Um, Marie and her team do a phenomenal job, and I think you, are, you guys will agree with me in making this a very, very special research opportunity for uh, each and every one of you to be able to take something meaningful back to your students, to have a full, rich curriculum uh, laid out for them with some hands-on, real-life uh, lessons that you can teach them based on the experiences that you've had here at Oak Ridge. Uh, one of the things that I learned when I first came to Oak Ridge was that um, this is kind of a winter wonderland in the respect that you come here and you're amazed. You know, you see all sorts of machines and laboratories and, and microscopes and the possibilities are endless that you can build upon a foundation of great education for students and great enrichment from a professional development uh, standpoint for educators as well. So when we came and we had the vision of working with um, ORNL and working with Marie's group very closely to have something that was meaningful and rich, there was a lot of time and effort put into it. As I listen to the presentations that you make and the experiences that you have, I think you got it. I think you got what we hoped you would achieve here um, at Oak Ridge National Labs and spending time in the lab with all of these phenomenal mentors that take so much time and effort. And the feedback that I get from them is that it's a, it's a big deal for them too. They have an opportunity to do something that they enjoy doing and that's teaching an educator that will ultimately touch many, many students through the lifetime of your career, which is what we hope. It's a scenario where we know that if you can have this enriched experience, that hopefully you'll be able to take it back to your students and each person will play it forward. So I like the, uh, the information that was shared earlier about the club or the experience that you're in in Chicago where you go back and you talk to other science teachers about what you've learned. Uh, we see that time and time again um, as we work with educators, educators for professional development. Through our Siemens STEM Institute, that was something that uh, really resonated throughout all of the programs that they wanted to go back and share with their school systems, they wanted to go back and share with their districts, with other teachers that were at their schools, to tell them about the experience and to talk about the resources that are out there. You know, where Siemens has a substantial investment, obviously, in STEM as a STEM educational foundation, we definitely want you to know that we're not the only uh, player in this game. There are lots of opportunities and lots of organizations that are really committed to make sure that you have the resources that are there, but you have to look for them. You have to research them and figure out exactly where they are and have these meaningful experiences that you can take back. I know that some educators that are here today have been through both of our programs. Um, you've had an opportunity to go through a Sumit STEM Institute. You know, we have Einstein fellows that are in the audience as well. So I think you guys are really taking advantage of all the great opportunities that are out there for you. And I encourage you to always do that and to always play it forward. From our perspective, you're a great representation of what a scientist is. Um, obviously, you have a different role than the scientists that are in these labs, but what you learn from them and the relationships that you build with them are what you'll take forward and you'll teach your students as you go back into the classrooms. So we encourage you to keep in contact um, with the great mentors that you've had here at the lab. And now that you know that the possibility is there and that there are great mentors throughout the country that are willing and able and have resources and time and energy that they would like to share with educators that have a passion like the ones you guys have exhibited here today, 
I encourage you to go back to your local labs and your local universities and have discussions about how to get your students into those classrooms and how to get your students into those labs to have meaningful experiences that will translate really into building the curriculum and building the reputation that you guys have for being such exceptional examples of what you need to do to go above and beyond to make your students have successful careers in the areas of STEM or just to expand their knowledge in the area of research as a whole. So with that being said, I want to again congratulate you for taking the time and the effort to find out about the Siemens STEM Institute and the Siemens STARS program here at Oak Ridge National Labs. We're excited that this is one of two that's going to happen this summer. Uh, we actually were very excited to have Marie do two. That's a lot, you know, to have this happen twice um, in a year. Usually we have it at another lab, but she has been kind and gracious enough to do two here this summer. So we're excited for another group to come through. I think that's a great opportunity for Synergies as well, because many of them will have the opportunity to work with some of the same mentors that you worked with. So with that in mind, definitely keep in contact with Marie. She'll always be a great resource for you to always connect. We think from our perspective that you guys, again, are an exceptional representation of what science should look like in the classrooms, what research should look like into the classrooms, and we want to recognize you for having this phenomenal experience with us. So with that being said, I'd like to invite a couple of colleagues, or three colleagues, to come back up. Marie, of course, um, from um, RAU, and Mary Rollins from Discovery Education, and Keisha Boykins from the Siemens Foundation. So now we have an opportunity to recognize you guys for your phenomenal efforts. certificate to remind you of this experience and your own lab coat because you are a scientist of course. Awesome. So my colleague Keisha Boykins will call your name and we'll, we'll have you come down one at a time and we'll position the first person so you guys take a look at how that happens and then, we'll take, <laughs> and then follow suit. We'll take pictures one by one. Does that work? So we have Brett, Brandon Gaynor, Iowa Hills, which is Julie Senior High School, Toledo, Ohio.
You guys have to go on Facebook and show us your uh, lab coat with your kids. We'd love to see that on oh, our oh, great.
Lutheran High School in Indianapolis, Indiana. Wade's Pike County High School 
going to try to get everybody. Everybody's looking here at me. There's a lot of cameras, but look here at me. Wait, Oh. What? Now it's out of balance. No, I'm just kidding. That's good. Right here. Some of you have balloons coming out of your head, so it looks really good. Good. Okay, hang in there. We want to get in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mary. Oh. Okay. Wow. Steps, huh? See, folks. <laughs> we can get everybody in. Anybody laugh? <laughs> <laughs> get the guy outside. Get the guy on the street. Looks good. That's great. Yeah, we got it. Okay, so uh, all of the all of the stars participants stay. So you guys stay. stay. We have a we have a short video in just a minute, like three or four minutes, if you want to see. And now you guys get to do a fun wacky one. Uh, now you get to be yourselves. into you being the student again. You know, when you teach for a while, you kind of get away from that idea. Uh, you are the teacher. You don't put your mindset sometimes back in the idea of that student. Or coming in here, it puts us back in the mindset of being a student of something we may not know much of anything about. We go through the whole process again and we learn something in the end, which is our whole point and purpose for teaching. It's really a, a matter of exciting the students. So I've been in here and I've just seen how the science can be applied and the things that you can do. And we're talking about plants and microbes and their interfaces and how all of that has long reaching effects. So just kind of inspiring my students to look at the big world and no matter where they look, there's some science in there. The teachers here have really, really top of the line teachers. They're really smart. They're very good pedagogically. And I've learned so much from the other teachers. That's kind of like the back door, like the back side of the program um, that I'll be bringing back to the classroom. One of the most powerful parts of this program is being able to work with teachers from all over the nation. Uh, it's fantastic to have the opportunity to be with 
like-minded teachers who do things a little different than, than we do it. And so you get to learn these lessons from all these other teachers and you know, you can make new friends and people that you can keep in touch with in the future. And, I mean, it's just been amazing. I think I've learned as much from the other teachers as I have from the other experiences that we've got. It's been a really amazing experience. We've had so many once in a lifetime opportunities to talk to people and see different things that I would have never been able to set up for myself. So the professional development piece has been wonderful. I think I have so many things to take back to the kids and experiences to talk about with them and that's priceless. down the years through the students of these teachers. So thank you. 